Hello, everybody. This is Christine So. Um, I'm the Executive Director of Global Health Council. Thank you for this webinar that is being co-hosted by Global Health Council with the uh, Action for Global Health. I have to say it's exciting today because we're actually um, doing this from Geneva, um, where Tim Rusin from um, Action for Global Health and I have been in meetings around civil society um, harmonization and coordination. So um, the, the setting is, is very appropriate, I think, for this webinar, and we're so pleased that um, Tim suggested it and that we were able to help out with it. So um, welcome to the discussion. Um, we are going to have a number of different speakers on today's webinar. Um, we have a bit of a change from the names that were um, presented originally just due to unforeseen circumstances. Tim will be giving us the um, overview of who will be speaking today, but I think that we really have some great information that will be shared, and we will have the opportunity for questions and answers and discussion. Um, so just one um, logistics uh, point is that you are invited to send in questions and comments um, as written comments through the chat box on the WebEx or you can email them to Liz Colway, who sent out your registration um, and call-in information. And um, when we get to the Q&A section, we will ask Liz to read those out loud, and then we can invite discussion from the panelists. Um, so with that, um, thanks again for joining us. I'm going to hand over the um, speaker's mic to Tim Rusin, who um, will give us an overview of what we're going to do today, and then we'll be getting started. Tim, over to you. Thank you, Christine, and um, exciting as well to be here. Um, as mentioned, I am coordinator of uh, Action for Global Health, a European um, member network of NGOs advocating on health. And so it's quite exciting to both uh, join physically here together as well as broadcast from, G from um, Geneva and bring together members both in the US and, and Europe. As Action Global Health, in, in partnership with, with many, in particular Global Health Council, we have been um, advocating on the right to health and universal health coverage and advocating to, uh, for the right to health and universal health coverage to be part of the new development uh, goals. And in the run-up, we have held numerous consultations with colleagues based in Africa, Latin America, and, and Asia. And one of the key, key uh, elements that we've uh, pushed for as, as a society is to make sure that we not only talk about health system strengthening and the health outcome or the financial element of it, but that the equity uh, component is, is essential. And so when rolling out universal health coverage, designing and rolling out universal health coverage, the um, role of civil society for us is key as one of the guarantees of ensuring there is an equitable implementation of universal health coverage. And therefore, uh, when we talk about the role of civil society, the discussion about more broadly accountability for global health is very important. And together with um, Global Health Council, um, 
we have held a number of uh, debates around what could be best practices, what could be uh, useful uh, experiences that exist around uh, accountability. And the um, webinar of today, the debate today, is trying to bring in part of that expertise. And so it's my <coughs> pleasure to uh, present and introduce to you a number of panelists um, that um, come from a broad range of, of, of expertise. Uh, first of all, uh, Susanna Hertz from uh, Global Health Vision, who is going to um, present for us the key findings from a report, a research on engendering accountability that will highlight some key principles on um, civil society-led campaigns and building from uh, that first presentation, I'm going to ask the following panelists to reflect on some of those findings and suggestions and uh, test whether these are being uh, taken into account in what is being set up currently um, at a global level. So we're going to start off with the first presentation and then following um, will be a second speaker, Lara uh, Brelli, who will uh, give us an update on the discussions around accountability of UHC in particular. Then we will uh, follow on with uh, Lola Da, president of uh, Chestret International based in Nigeria. And if the internet connection um, is stable and good enough, uh, we will bring in um, Lola to give us an update on the um, collaborative, the global collaborative on, on uh, performance measurements and accountability. After those uh, quick, uh, not quick, after those interventions, there will be time for questions, um, questions for clarifications as well as, as, as inputs. As mentioned, uh, we will use for the sake of, uh, of managing this call written um, questions, which I will put forward to the panelists, and then we will conclude. Before I hand over the floor to uh, Susanna to make the first presentation, I'd like to read out a statement that was the result of a two-day meeting that we held in Montreux on the 7th and 8th of December around harmonization of advocacy ad, uh, efforts um, in support of, of uh, universal health coverage and in particular the role of civil society um, under the, the banner of speaking with one voice stronger together. And the meeting brought together not only a very broad range of, of civil society actors from across the health sector but as well had, had colleagues from, from global initiatives that participated um, at the meeting. And so if you allow me I'll, I'll quickly read out the, the statement which reads as following. We representatives from the international development agencies and global and local civil society organizations gathered to work on improving harmonization and alignment of advocacy around health system strengthening for universal health coverage and the sustainable development of health targets at the country and community levels. Together we call for urgent action towards better harmonization and alignment of advocacy and agreed to develop a plan of action to be implemented at the country, regional and global levels. We therefore commit to meet again during the upcoming uh, 2016 World Health Assembly to assess progress on the plan of action and continue to move forward on this, our common agenda. And we invite all agencies and organizations to join us in this ambitious undertaking. And with this invitation to you all, I will uh, conclude and invite our first speaker and presenter, Susanna, to start her presentation. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, good morning and afternoon and evening to everybody, depending on where you are in the world. Um, thanks very much for having me. Um, I'm just getting my screen sharing set up here. Can you all see the point? Okay, can you all see the PowerPoint? Yep, it looks good. Okay, great. So 
So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about five principles for successful civil society-led accountability campaigns. Um, as Tim mentioned, this is based off of um, a, a research project and report that we um, completed uh, and released in September called Engendering Accountability, Upholding Commitments to Maternal and Newborn Health. Um, and while it the report had a maternal and newborn health focus, um, it definitely has um, applicability to um, many health issue areas. Um, and so hopefully will be, be um, interesting and useful to all of you on the call. Um, I want to acknowledge my fellow authors um, on the report. Um, the primary authors were Robin Sneeringer, myself, and Kristen Cox Mailing. And um, we had country case studies written by Renuka Motihar in India, Toyan Akpan in Nigeria, and Drake Mukundu in Uganda. Um, I also want to acknowledge the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Children's Investment Fund Foundation for supporting the research um, and the report. Um, so just a little bit of background. Um, why did we conduct a landscaping of civil society maternal newborn health accountability efforts? Um, there's, there's clearly a sort of a somewhat strong understanding and documentation of global accountability mechanisms. Um, and people seem to also have um, a good uh, understanding of kind of the definition of accountability. But um, there's a real need for understanding regional, national, and subnational accountability efforts, and particularly showcasing um, examples of, of successful and promising models that really show how to put accountability into practice. Um, there was also a need to um, outline some uh, recommendations around accountability for the Every Newborn Action Plan and the uh, um, Ending Preventable Maternal Mortality Strategy, which launched in 2014 and early 2015, respectively. Um, and then, of course, the opportunity afforded by the SDGs and the Global Strategy 2.0, um, the Global Strategy for Women's, Children's, and Adolescents' Health, to sort of revisit and reshape how accountability is designed for global frameworks um, especially in terms of how they play out at the country level. Um, the report aimed to really redirect how the RMNCH community thinks about accountability. Um, and again, I, I reference RMNCH because um, that was really the focus of the report, but um, it does have very much applicability beyond that. Um, we wanted to really elevate the important role of civil society and accountability and explain how to operationalize accountability at the national and subnational levels so that stakeholders can start to really shift their focus there. Um, and then to inform the planning and implementation of effective and evidence-based accountability mechanisms. Um, so the report, a little bit about kind of the study methodology and, um, and the research behind the report. We used a mixed method um, qualitative evaluation that included um, interviews with global, regional, um, and country-level stakeholders, um, desk reviews at, at global, regional, and country level. Um, the initial interviewees were identified based on input from, from the researchers, from the donors, um, and then we used sort of a snowball sampling technique. So based on input from those interviews, we're able to identify others. And then we also tapped into the expertise of our um, consultants in country to provide recommendations on the interviewees there. Um, we do have three in-depth case studies in India, Nigeria, and Uganda. They are summarized in the full report, and then um, they're also available separately in their full form um, in our website. Um, and then we pulled together comprehensive findings and recommendations um, based, on, based on the research and interviews, and then we were able to sort of build out some guidelines for building effective accountability processes and mechanisms um, with civil society really at the, at the core. For the purposes of our research, we um, aim to really look at comprehensive accountability. Um, so those that include sort of at all of these various components or as many of them as possible um, and strategically link local, state, national accountability tools data and tactics to government policies, budgets, and programs. Um, we found that there are, there are a lot of efforts out there that, um, are, that are producing data, that are monitoring 
progress, um, but often there's a disconnect between connecting that to action and really um, looking at what happens with the information and how that's being used um, and leading to um, enforcement, remedial action by decision makers, um, and then ultimately improved services and health outcomes. Um, so I, just a quick sort of overview of um, some of the findings and recommendations, and then I'll provide some more examples from our country case studies. Um, we actually highlight 20 recommendations that are drawn from the research, um, but I've sort of drilled them down here into four key, key ones, which are um, go local. I think this is uh, fairly obvious to many of us on the line, but there's a real disconnect between commitments at the global level and awareness of those commitments among country stakeholders and, and subnational stakeholders. And that really impedes progress. So we really need to shift our focus towards the, the national and subnational level and to partners there um, and support them to implement strategic accountability efforts to achieve our shared goal, our shared goals. Um, we also need to really do a better uh, a better job of aligning global initiatives in country. Um, Engaging and empowering civil society um, really to achieve uh, local, national, and global goals. Um, civil society needs to be at the heart of accountability efforts. They need to be actively engaged and, and um, effectively and meaningfully engaged in accountability processes. Um, and civil society needs to be strengthened and empowered with resources and support and technical assistance in order to do that. Um, Connecting data to action, I alluded to this a little bit in the previous slide, but um, many of, of accountability efforts to date have focused on the collection of accurate data, but we really can't stop there. So there's a real need to look at how that data is being used, um, looking at the analysis, packaging, and interpretation of data by key stakeholders, um, and looking at the value of sort of different types of data and making sure that we're evaluating user-centric local data um, as well as sort of population-based um, data sources. And then finally, maximizing local partnerships. Um, when a variety of stakeholders come together to review evidence, to identify gaps and bottlenecks, um, and to agree on actions collaboratively, it really fosters buy-in, it builds trust, um, and ultimately it leads to change. Um, so we really found that the most Successful and promising models are those where government, civil society, parliamentarians, health professionals, media, um, and other partners are coming together to really work through, um, work on accountability co collectively um, and uh, ensuring that civil society has a really strong and valuable role in that. Um, and of course, there's no one, fit, one size fits all to accountability. It needs to be context specific, but um, I think these recommendations sort of apply across many contexts. Uh, so as I said, we did country case studies in India, Uganda, and Nigeria. Um, just a, a couple of over pieces of information about India and Uganda, and then I'm going to go into a few specific examples from our Nigeria case study. Um, in India, accountability for maternal and newborn health in particular is fairly nascent. Um, it does draw from a long history of, of civil society activism in India. Um, but there's really a current climate there of shrinking spaces for civil society voice um, and a need to better link grassroots activism to policy change um, at the state and national level. Um, in Uganda, accountability has really, as it's risen on the development agenda, it has really risen within Uganda itself and there's quite a lot happening on accountability in Uganda and quite a lot of government support for it. Um, uh, the government has actually supported and emphasized grassroots programs to enhance accountability. Um, but again, there need to be some better systems in place for syst systemat um, systematizing those various efforts and really linking the grassroots service delivery focused efforts with government policy change. And then in Nigeria, um, uh, there are some good examples of uh, partners who are drawing on global initiatives to develop country accountability mechanisms, engaging multiple partners, and utilizing a variety of accountability tools and tactics. 
Um, but those models really have taken a long time to develop because there has been a need to really build that trust between civil society, government, and other stakeholders and show how accountability efforts can be mutually beneficial. So um, some good examples and also a long way to go. Um, and there, was, there were fewer examples in Nigeria of kind of grassroots local accountability efforts um, as opposed to the other countries. Um, so a, a couple of um, uh, examples to highlight in Nigeria. Um, the first is uh, the accountability for MNCH in Nigeria coalition and the Nigeria Independent Accountability Mechanism. Um, so AMIN is a coordination platform of 15 civil society organizations, health professional associations, and media organizations that are advocating for better MNCH in Nigeria. Um, and then the, Ni the Nigeria Independent P Accountability Mechanism, or NIAM, um, was set up um, with sort of within and with support of AMIN and with support from Evidence for Action, MAMAYE, um, when the um, WHO uh, uh, and Global Strategies, COYA, which is the Commission on Information and Accountability related to the first global strategy for women's and children's health, um, when they uh, set out the, these country accountability frameworks for countries to um, implement the COYA recommendations, um, the Nigeria Independent Accountability Mechanism was set up to monitor that process. Um, so they, they with, with partners in the government, um, they worked to develop indicators, to develop a baseline, baseline assessment, and then to um, develop an annual scorecard for monitoring um, the implementation of the country accountability framework for COYA. Um, so just a couple of kind of uh, uh, results of, of some of AMIN and NIAM's work. Um, AMIN has, was really instrumental in um, the national, getting the National Health Act finally signed, and they're now working on finalizing some scorecards to track MNCH indicators um, quarterly. Um, and then NIAM has made Nigeria um, one of the only countries that has that sort of independent monitoring mechanism, like I described, um, for the COYA country accountability frameworks and has really set up a strong and meaningful um, way for civil society to be engaged in that process. Um, and as of 2014, Nigeria had showed significant improvement in six out of the seven groups of indicators within that country accountability framework. Um, the second example is um, called the Know Your Budget Partnership. Um, this was formed as a civil society network um, engaged in budget analysis, advocacy, and accountability. Um, and then with support and technical assistance from SAVI, which is a state accountability and voice initiative supported by DFID, um, the Know Your Budget Network was able to utilize creative multimedia strategies like public forums, radio, um, TV discussion programs, et cetera, to reach elected representatives and key um, members of the state government with information and data about the budget. Um, their main focus initially was to get the government to adjust its overinflated budget so that they could actually be held accountable to a realistic budget, and they succeeded in doing that. Um, and really set a precedent in the, in the um, state and sent a message to the government that non-state actors um, who were informed could really um, galvanize public opinion and that they were watching it and engaged um, in this process. And then in April 2015, MNCH2, um, which is another um, DFID program focused specifically on, on maternal, newborn, and child health, set up an accountability mechanism in Kaduna State, um, which is modeled off of the Know Your Budget Network, um, made up of representatives from government, civil society, media, and development partners. So we'll see um, what happens as that plays out. Um, and then the last example I wanted to highlight is the Jigawa State MNCH Accountability Forum. Um, so Evidence for Action, Mama Ye facilitated the creation of a state-level evidence-based um, mechanism made up of media, civil society, professional bodies. Um, it's co-chaired by a civil society representative and a government representative 
which sort of allows for that um, buy-in and uh, leadership from key players um, in, uh, from different stakeholder groups. Um, before the creation of this forum, um, there was the health managers in the state were really struggling to use evidence for decision making and to assess the performance of the health system. Um, but the the accountability forum set up a number of subcommittees. So there's a an evidence advocacy and knowledge management and communication subcommittee that helped to really reorganize the evidence and package it into scorecards to use for strategic advocacy at multiple levels. Um, so similar mechanisms have been set up in um, four, uh, three other states and um, hopefully they are leaning and aiming to have them connect with the um, AMIN, the National Accountability Group. Um, the, <clears throat> excuse me, some of their work led to the recommitment of withdrawn funds based on the evidence um, that showed that um, there was high stockouts of drugs and so they were able to get funds recommitted to um, focus on procurement and ensuring that um, those drugs and supplies were available in facilities. Um, and uh, as I said, this, this has sort of really enabled the health managers to have access to data that is um, packaged in a way that's easy to use and understand and, um, and implement influence decision making. So um, from our findings and our recommendations, um, pulling together all of the information that we gathered from the country case studies, from our interviews with global, regional, and national stakeholders, um, from the desk research, we uh, developed six guiding principles to inform the development of successful accountability campaigns. Um, the first one is to build from the grassroots and know your context. So starting local, building linkages um, from local to the subnational, to the national, and to the global level. I mean, really understanding the political economy and the stakeholder landscape. So it's really critical to understand who your allies are or potential allies are in government um, who recognize the value um, of civil society engagement and or people who care about the same issues and can be kind of brought on board with, with the value of civil society involvement and accountability. Um, creating diverse coalitions, I think this came through quite clearly in the examples that, um, that I highlighted, but that partnerships and alliances can really help to reinforce um, transparency and create buy-in um, and build trust. Um, develop and disseminate the evidence. Obviously, this is critical. Without solid evidence and data, we really can't have accountability. Um, so, for example, uh, in Uganda, the White Ribbon Alliance um, collected their own facility level data, um, assessing the readiness of facilities to provide comprehensive um, emergency obstetric care. The government had committed to providing comprehensive emergency obstetric and newborn care in half of level four facilities and WRA worked with um, health professionals, uh, with the facilities, with citizens to gather data that was really local and very user friendly um, and feed that data back to the government at the, at the subnational and national level uh, to be able to show that these facilities were not equipped and were not prepared to provide comprehensive uh, emergency obstetric and newborn care and with that data and with that advocacy effort the government then committed funds to increase staff and to um, ensure that the facilities were appropriately stocked with with equipment and supplies. So that data is really critical and again emphasizing the importance of different kinds of data so we know that population-based national data is very important um, also this kind of local uh, real-time data is also critically important for accountability. Um, engage with partners and create space for meaningful dialogue. Um, really want to emphasize the importance of building off systems that are already in place where possible. Um, and if not, there's a real need to create that space where um, there's an opportunity for public input into government processes or community-based platforms. Um, another quick example, in India, 
uh, community action for health is building upon the government mandated maternal death review system which was implemented nationwide by the government of, of India in 2010 um, but what they have done is gathered additional data to support um, maternal death review data um, that gives a more complete picture of kind of what happened so going beyond just the cause of death and looking at social determinants of health um, and then also uh, engaging a range of stakeholders um, at the local and state level from health workers to government representatives um, to citizens to collectively review the information and propose improvements that various stakeholders can take. So they've taken a, an existing government system and process and really built upon it to um, create something that's more effective and comprehensive. Um, strengthening oversight uh, the important piece here is both um, sanctioning unaccountable behavior but also rewarding accountable behavior. Um, this is so important because often we ask the question sort of what are the consequences, what happens when uh, leaders are shown to be unaccountable. Um, and uh, we can work with media to highlight examples of both success stories and unmet commitments or lack of transparency and we can also really celebrate the champions and the leaders who are meeting commitments um, and, and sort of create some healthy competition without um, a really uh, confrontational name and shame approach. And then finally um, communicate and follow up um, recognizing the real need that, this, that accountability is a continual process and the importance of, of kind of reporting back on what the outcomes of various efforts have been. So um, in Uganda, the government has a program called Barasas, or public meetings, where citizens can ask questions and voice concerns about how resources have been used for local service delivery. Um, the issues are then recorded and sent to respective departments at the district or national level, um, depending on who's best positioned to respond. And then at subsequent Barasas, or public meetings, the district leaders then report back on the action taken to address those prior items that were identified. And, and that's really important and I think is again often a missing piece um, that there's a report back to the citizens, to the local level, to the health facilities about how um, their, their information and, and data and efforts have, um, are leading to change or what's happening with that information. Um, so just concluding with um, the the statement that there's a real need to invest in governance, transparency, and citizen, void, citizen voice writ large. Um, there's an enormous opportunity for learning on accountability across sectors. So I think with our report, we really only begun to scratch, scratch the surface in terms of um, uh, focusing on, on maternal and newborn health. And we did sort of dip into a few other uh, accountability mechanisms that were a bit broader or that focused on other health and development areas but really recognizing that there's so much more to be learned um, and uh, really a, a need to be connecting across different health sectors across different development sectors so that we can learn from each other um, and the findings of our report though we focused on this lens of maternal and newborn health um, and these guiding principles of successful civil society-led accountability campaigns we believe are very applicable to many health and development issues and hope um, that uh, they will be helpful to all of you. And with that I will conclude. Thank you Susanna for a great, great presentation. Um, just for colleagues that are on the call the presentation and the other presentations that follow are going to be shared with you and also be going to be posted online as being be put available. Um, thank you, Susanna, because this is actually um, so useful as it builds on evidence, it builds on experiences within countries, and as you mentioned at the end, and that's key reasons why we want to wanted to start with this presentation is that we see these guiding principles, the six principles, really applicable well beyond the maternal and newborn um, health. And so the, the continuum of accountability that we referred to from first up until the very end where uh, is being going back to the community to uh, explain what actually has been done with the input is essential for the whole of, of the health sector. And 
many of the findings that you referred to uh, for many of us have been on held obvious ones. Eh? The, the, what we are pleading for is that there should be meaningful society involvement uh, and it's great to actually have evidence backing up that statement. Now I'd like to go to the um, next speaker um, inviting her to reflect on, on how these uh, or some of these guiding principles could be or should be applied. Um, so allow me to introduce to Lara Bradley, um, known to many as <laughs> active activist or health advocate at least on universal health uh, coverage. Lara is uh, currently consultant for Management Sciences for Health, uh, in particularly working on accountability and, and universal health coverage. And so <clears throat> the um, question um, is, I guess, twofold first. Uh, if you could give us an update on the current discussions around accountability uh, on universal health coverage and uh, its potential to strengthen accountability for health more broadly. And when you look at the current state of play, although it's still um, very lively, um, do you see elements of those guiding principles that were referred to already reflected in the discussions, yes or no? Thank you and over to you. Thank you very much, Tim, and thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this webinar. I hope people can hear me well. There's a PowerPoint that I believe is now up on your screens, um, and uh, I will just try and go through this quite quickly to avoid PowerPoint overload, um, but just to give you a quick update on the work that we're doing at MSH. So I'm working with MSH and it's supported by the Rockefeller Foundation and this is very much a partnership approach. So whilst the slides are branded MSH, I hope that in the future these will be multi-stakeholder slides and multi-stakeholder agendas. Um, but we're working closely with the World Health Organization, with Save the Children, USAID, ILO, the governments of Germany and Japan and others on this um, agenda to try and uh, inform the discussions on accountability options for UHC. Change the slides. Sorry. Liz will. Ah, could we move to the next slide, please? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so. Why is accountability important for UHC? I, I'm not going to talk too much to this because I think people may already have a sense and best sense than me. But the health SDGs present a more comprehensive agenda than the MDGs. Now this is a wonderful thing, but it has the risk of uh, verticalizing further the health landscape. There's also this commitment to leave no one behind in the SDGs, and this is something that can be a rallying call for the accountability movement. The opportunity of Target 3.8 on UHC, as the preamble to the SDG declaration says, is that UHC is an underpinning concept, an underpinning agenda that brings benefits across the SDG target areas for health. It is inherently a political concept and it's about redistribution of resources in society and as such I think it's a natural home for an accountability agenda bringing um, structure and systematic engagement for civil society and citizens so that there's more voice between and, and dialogue between citizens and the state as the primary duty bearer for the right to health. Uh, UHC is very much a health system's goal and on, as a goal for the health system it's the pathway towards UHC that matters and for this I think it's why it needs to be a rallying call for the whole health sector because informing that pathway is critical and informing that pathway so that it complies, adheres to the principles of progressive universalism and shared responsibility and meaningful participation is crucial and accountability can be a mechanism for this. So accountability I'm using, I'm defining to encompass three interconnected agendas of functions of monitoring, review and remedial action and, and these are really critical throughout the cycle of, for accountability and civil society I think has a role to play in, in each of these in different ways. Accountability in UHC can guide implementation and accelerate progress not just for Target 3.8 but across the health agenda and today or yesterday the WHO launched a new report called Health in 2015 from MDGs to SDGs and this is the same narrative they're making whereby UHC can serve as some sort of umbrella concept. Um, could somebody mute, mute, mute the microphone? Sorry there was some disturbance, thanks. Um, so, so I think that there is a movement towards using UHC as an agenda 
in behind which all of the different stakeholders and, and sub themes in health can can come in to help shape that pathway, and, and this is I think a, a really important opportunity. Accountability for UHC, I also think needs to needs to work around three different dimensions of UHCQ, which are the population coverage, effective services with quality, and the level of financial protection provided. And it is accountability for various uh, things, which include financial resources, performance, and political processes. The reason why this is particularly important, as I mentioned before, is the risk of proliferation and verticalization with an expanded, more comprehensive agenda for health under the SDGs. And, and there, I think we need to take responsibility for being more integrated as we talk about the health narrative. Ultimately, we're talking about individual people who have multiple overlapping health needs. And we need to think about their needs comprehensively. We can move on to the next slide, please. So the, the objectives that we've identified, I'm sorry that on your screen it's showing up as funny numbering, I think it's a problem between Macs and PCs, um, the formatting, but we've identified a few objectives that we think would help to advance the accountability agenda for UHC. One is increased political prioritization of UHC with sufficient sustainable and equitable investment and implementation of robust policies for progressive universalism, meaning, meaning closing gaps on the pathway towards universal. Number two is strengthened evidence for accountability and advocacy for UHC. And number three is institutionalized and harmonized multi-stakeholder mechanisms for accountability for UHC. And these should be aligned with country processes, such as platforms for information and accountability and the joint annual review where they exist. Next slide, please. Um, and certainly, I'm not going to go into this in much detail, but when we think about what would strengthen accountability for UHC moving forward, we really must make sure that we're adding value and filling gaps. So we need to know our landscape that exists and know the lessons of existing initiatives, as Susanna was referring to. And, and I think those kinds of studies and work are critical to inform the pathway moving forward. So I very much welcome it and look forward to working more closely on helping to shape the CSO component of this accountability agenda for UHC, drawing on that work. So I'm not going to go through all of this, but there is certainly a lot that already exists that feeds into the UHC agenda for monitoring, review, and action. And we need to build on this landscape and complement it moving forwards. So just to summarize, the next slide is some proposals of building on the evidence to date of what essential elements for accountability are and have been in existing mechanisms and existing landscapes for accountability for other health agendas and beyond the sector. And these are, these are suggestions. Um, so the suggestions that are on this slide will be uh, put out into a public consultation on UHC Day this Saturday. And we would love for people to reflect on and feed into this and thoughts and reflections and experiences that help us strengthen these proposals. The idea is to put forward a proposal um, after a consultation process to the German Healthy Systems, Healthy Lives roadmap process, which is going to be launched around the Japanese presidency of the G7 at the end of May, and that this will help to articulate a health systems and UHC landscape and priority work plan moving forward. So we think that accountability has to be a central part to this, and we're trying to put proposals into that, uh, that framing. So on this slide, I've suggested a list of things. Now, this is not comprehensive, and it's certainly not perfect, but these are some ideas to put out there for reflection. I'll just quickly talk through them. So the idea, learning particularly from the polio community and the women and children's and adolescents health community of having independent accountability. Richard Horton has shouted loud and clear that this is is essential to any kind of an accountability mechanism or agenda, and I think he's right. So independent accountability panel, some sort of an eminent technical and political, particularly political panel that has leverage over governments and different stakeholders who could produce an annual commentary, not a big piece of research, but certainly drawing on the existing evidence from a range of sources to make, um, to say things that other stakeholders, institutions, agencies are unlikely or unable to say, to tell people where they see the challenges 
uh, existing and where the opportunities for change are, but also celebrating successes. So this could be positioned and to inform the political, intergovernmental and national processes for accountability, such as the high-level political forum and the World Health Assembly. The next thing on this list is an advisory group. So there is already an accountability, sorry, a monitoring report done by the WHO and the World Bank that's planned to be an annual report on UHC. It, it measures targets for 3.8 in the SDGs, um, and, and it's planned to continue. So our proposal is for a multi-stakeholder advisory group to that that would make more transparent and systematic the kinds of engagements that currently exist, but, but making them uh, more, more formalized in their involvement in that report in an ongoing manner. Um, I think that it would be of added value to have different stakeholders there, experts, civil society, media and parliamentarians included, um, who could, and as, as well as government experts who engage in, in doing the, the monitoring of UHC themselves but to uh, reflect on and strengthen the methods agenda for, uh, for measuring UHC, but also on the presentation and utilization of the content so that this is really maximized as an opportunity to inform accountability processes. The third on this list is country profiles on UHC progress. So personally, I think that the indicators for the SDGs may help for, for their specific purpose, but when it comes to country dialogues on process, towards UHC, progress towards UHC, we really need a broader sense of what's going on. And, and similar to the countdown to 2015 profiles that bring together a range of indicators that are presented effectively uh, onto a page, I think there could be some sort of a range of indicators on two sheets that different stakeholders could use, such as parliamentarians, media, civil society IT policy makers, program managers, to get a snapshot of progress and also a sense of change over time for their particular context. Now, I personally think that this would also be particularly useful if it was produced by and tailored for countries individually, not as a comparative tool per se across countries, but really a country-owned uh, product. Uh, the fourth item on this list is strengthen multi-stakeholder platforms for UHC review. So here, this is sort of a formal accountability opportunity within the health system. So the, the platforms that exist, whether they're joint annual reviews or, or sort of some sort of a harmonized health governance mechanism which has different stakeholders around the table. Now, the systematic engagement of civil society, the extent to which they're representative of the health agenda at large, the extent that they can uh, be empowered with evidence and supported by a coalition of civil society to engage in those processes could be strengthened. The fifth item on this list is CSO consortium. So here I uh, look to others really to help inform how this gets developed, but I certainly think that for UHC there is a deficit and a gap. There are certain things that exist, so global health strategies convenes a coalition of civil society actors and others around UHC. HC Day, which you'll all hopefully be aware of, um, but I think going beyond that we could do with some better coordination across the health sector on CSO engagement, on CSO capacity strengthening, financial and technical support to civil society, guidelines and tools, and peer exchange. Um, and I think this could be shaped up with a lot of people's inputs from these call, this call and this webinar, and it would be brilliant to see this taking shape as, as a sort of submission to the roadmap of what could be a strong mechanism for accountability moving forwards. And finally, the community of practice. So in addition to civil society stakeholders, I think on UHC monitoring and accountability, a multi-stakeholder mechanism for, for people within ministries of health who are responsible for this, for academics, for others from country level, particularly to have a forum for exchange, a platform where they can learn from each other and share their experiences. This was a request by the informal conversations I've been happening with, have, happen, uh, have, sorry, having with different stakeholders in, in the production of this paper, um, and there was a request from country partners who are working on monitoring and accountability of UHC domestically, to say, well, we want to be able to work across re our regions and with other countries and share and learn from each other. So this, I think, could build on existing mechanisms, so the joint learning network for UHC is an existing mechanism for country partners, and certainly having a focused group on monitoring and accountability for UHC would be an interesting addition to that work. 
So you'll almost hear the end of my voice now, but I, I think an important question moving forwards will be how does this get operationalized? Now, um, I, I'm unable to speak at length about this, but I certainly think that the roadmap that the Germans and WHO are driving will be a, a useful forum for this to be included. We had a side event at WHO this morning on universal health coverage where the Germans expressed interest in the accountability work and I, I hope that we'll be able to make this a constructive part of the roadmap moving forwards. And to do that, I think we need to come together. So this is a bit of a plea to say that um, this will be a consultation online, as I mentioned this week from this weekend. Please do engage, please do submit, get in touch with me if you're particularly interested in this and want to get more involved. Uh, it, it's planned to be a multi-partner activity and initiative. The other thing I'll just say that is that, as mentioned this morning, it's the WHO event. Uh, sorry, it was WHO, ILO, Save the Children and Various Governments. But as mentioned by the Japanese speaker, it was the ambassador for the mission here, and she said that the Japanese government, as part of their presidency of the G7, has a big priority for UHC for May 2016. And as part of that, they are keen to see some sort of an international alliance that potentially builds on existing efforts but for UHC and for better coordination of stakeholders around UHC, but also mutual accountability. So I think that is where we're aiming for, that this work could be coordinated from. That's the vision I have for now, but I'm open to ideas. So I will stop there, but thank you very much again for the opportunity to share this, and I look forward to working with you more. Thank you, Lara, for a very extensive and uh, passionate presentation. Um, we do understand there's many stakeholders involved and a multi-stakeholder effort is what we want to, to achieve. Uh, there's a lot of potential and appetite as it seems. And I um, also heard a invitation to participate in a public consultation uh, in the coming weeks from this uh, weekend onwards and we will not miss that invitation as Extra Global Health and I'm sure many other colleagues. So thank you for that, um, Lara. Um, I will now move on to our next panelist and speaker, um, Lola Dar, uh, president of Chestret, based in Nigeria, but um, known to many of us also as a global health activist and a convener of global health, um, involved in many of the global discussions amongst others uh, and, and also involved uh, in the global uh, data collaborative uh, that has been uh, set up. And so it's my, my pleasure to um, invite uh, Lola to share uh, with us uh, an update on, on what is being discussed and reflecting on the presentation that was made by, by Susanna and reflecting those guiding principles, uh, whether you could share your insight and thoughts on how civil society would be or could be involved meaningfully when it comes to data collection, review, and potential action. So hereby I pass over to you, and I do hope that the, the connection will allow us to uh, share your presentation and hear your thoughts. Over to you. Thank you to everybody for the opportunity to speak. It's been quite challenging to connect, and that is part of one of part of the difficulties of um, working at global level to to engage uh, low, uh, country level to engage. I'm going to go quickly through this set of slides. I apologize to those who have been at the accountability meeting in November because it's really basically the same set of slides where we had introduced the work that's been done at the country level. This is looking at this from the country for perspective and looking at what's happening at the country level. In preparation for that work, we had done uh, published a report um, one at the, was was released at the data summit uh, in June in December, in in June um, in Washington, and that really identified the myriad of country platforms on accountability, all driven by global priorities. There is no country that has set up a platform on accountability on its own. So in the wake of every woman, every child, some countries had up to 42 programs driven by global initiatives and 42 accountability platforms at the country level. This is the context in which we should look at this. The second report, which we published with the GFC as well, is looking at how do we then, as civil society, 
move forward accountability and amplify voices and action. This is what we presented at the, and, and you have linked to the report in the in the set of slides that we've just sent, and I hope the organizers will share the set of slides and the link with you. Specifically to what then do we do? Can I have the next slide, please? What then do we do? Accountability is a complex process, and what we've discussed with the Data Collaborative, and I'm sure some of you have heard about the Data Collaborative, although I'll come back to that, is that we've shared these slides with them. It's a complex and interactive process. It's not a linear process, and it's not a it's a very political process. It includes processes which we usually look at as neutral monitoring and reporting. It and the IHP Plus has been doing a lot of monitoring and reporting. Uh, up to 22 countries have participated in four rounds of IHP Plus, and um, nothing happens to the reports. It includes behavior. What do you what what happens to reports? What action do we take? It includes accountability for resources and it includes accountability for results. And many times the interaction between processes, behavior, and resources is very political at the country level. It's not a technical process. How independent is independent and how can civil society be a part of that independence without attribution and sanctions for their voices? That, that, that These are the questions that have been asked at the country level. So two, two big questions come out of that. One, how do partners behave at the country level, and how can we then um, how can we hold partners and national government jointly accountable at the country level to the behavior and the processes that account for results? The second, the, the second bit is how do we measure meaningful civil society participation when you have 42 platforms in health alone, all of them having accountability processes um, at the country level and potentially all of them not talking to each other because their incentive systems are also not encouraging the collaboration across platforms. Um, incentive systems are driven by the need for replenishment and then that's also a political process. Each, each program needs to replenish and needs to show its own accountability. That hits us at country level as 42 accountability platforms. How independent is independent and what part of independence can civil society play? The reluctance to to shift and to move from just a technical process and to combine the political and technical process means that the independence is questionable. I, and I've heard Susanna also talk about the process in Nigeria. There are many other processes related to that in Nigeria and none of them are talking to each other because they've come from a global sphere and the accountability lines are not are, are, are very vertical and still not, not horizontal enough. Next please. So we, we come to a, we come to a situation at country level where we look at the demand side and the supply side. The supply side we have invested well in, although we need to do better, we need to improve quality of indicators. But quite frankly, we don't need many more indicators because the indicators we already have are in tally sheets, they're in manual forms, they're not being used, and even when they're electronic, they're just used for the purpose of reporting to the global community. The utilization at the country level is very minimal, be it for policy, planning, or accountability demand. And so there's an, there's a, there's an open load of investment in the supply side, leading to an imbalance. The demand side starts with utilization, and utilization can be for many things, for action, for remedial, for dialogue as a process of incentivizing, incentivizing action, for sanctions, for beetle blowing, and also for reward where things are going well. This is where the, the, the challenge is, balancing the supply, investment in the supply and the demand side, and engaging society, civil society meaningfully. Meaningful civil society engagement, we also looked at about 10 indicators for meaningful civil society engagement, which unfortunately are not in this set of slides, but you will find in the report. And what are the indications of meaningful civil society engagement? The first indication is that civil society is resourced. And I'm not going to say that because I think many people are saying that again and again. North and South, there's an expectation that civil society advocacy and accountability action is going to happen on goodwill and passion. It's not. It needs to be resourced. Two, civil society has to have a mutually respectful place in the various platforms. Three, civil society does not have the capacity to attend to 42 platforms. And so there needs to be a real agenda on harmonization, which starts from programming to influence accountability. 
Three, civil society voices need to be protected. And four, civil society needs to also organize itself, recognizing the power in its diversity, but also being able to, to use the best of that diversity. So we have um, about 12 indicators on what meaningful civil society engagement could be in policy, planning, and financing. Now, next slide, please. It goes on to how has that impacted on the data, data collaboration? It's been, it's been um, a challenge to shift. There's a transformational shift that is required in the discussion on accountability from where it's purely a technical discussion, one, and to where it's purely a discussion amongst agencies. At the moment, the discussion is really, and the accountability issue is really amongst global agencies and how they hold countries to account. The mutuality there is, it, it, it does not exist, and the IHP Plus report has shown that again and again. The mutuality is that the countries are doing better than the development agencies, and forums show even some retrogression in the willingness, the political will of, of development agencies to be accountable. And so the data collaborative also came up to, it is also challenged by this reality. But to us, we see it as an opportunity. It's an opportunity because it's one platform everyone has signed on to. Um, and th this slide shows you the variety of accountability platforms and the potential that the data collaborative has to bring them around different stakeholders. And for simplicity, we've just identified the three major stakeholders, government, civil society, development partners, and technical agencies. At the center of that is the, is the collaborative. The collaborative first is a is a potential comes up with a huge potential to harmonize, align, and improve this plethora of accountability platforms. And everybody is signed on to the global collaborative, including the the leaders. Two, it gives us the opportunity to balance the technical and the, the, the supply side and the demand side. That is monitoring, review, and act. It gives us a, an opportunity to balance that. And it provides, because countries are very visible in the data collaborative, it provides an opportunity for stronger, more, not just a few, there's not enough yet, more of country voices and stronger country voices local to global. Next, next one, please. So the civil society, um, we, 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 there, there's, a, there's a Google group of civil society of about 42 actors. At the first and only discussion we've heard, we came up with an inside-out approach, which we have shared with the Secretariat of the, of the Data Collaborative, and we understand that the new iteration will reflect this understanding. There are some things that civil society can do within the collaborative, and there are some things civil society cannot do within the collaborative because of the nature of the collaborative itself. It's very politically nuanced and needs to be politically correct all the time. It's sitting in WHO. It's, um, it's between countries largely, although civil society remains very active in it. The first draft of the operational report did not reflect adequately the discussions we've been having with civil society. We've had a discussion with the Secretariat, and the Secretariat has indicated that it would include this slide, this last slide, in its, in its, in its iteration. Monitor, the monitor bit of it costed M&E plans, country institutional capacities, population surveys, facility and community, and administrative information systems, disease surveillance, are really where we can engage. Civil society does not really have a leadership role in that because it's the relationship between government and the technical agencies, technical partners, although civil society can build capacity, can help in collecting data, can help in instituting, can help in collecting data, especially from non-state actors who are engaged in service delivery. And so that, that, that's, that's where we, we identify an inside approach that helps us to engage. The middle bit is the review. In, in reviews, it's a joint stakeholder activity, like Lara said. There are many opportunities to have that joint activity, and we think it should align behind joint annual reviews in the health sector, or, where possible, national accountability reviews led by either the Ministry of Finance or the, or the National Planning Ministry. This is because we need to reflect the multi-sectorality of health, health for all and health in all. And so in some countries, the, 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 the review process is linked to the central processes and engages parliament. It also allows us to set up and follow the pathway that has been proposed in the SDG and then also by the, by the um, 
statistical commission of multi-sector reviews that enable act, that enable political action um, at country level. And so um, there are there are various options. For instance, Rwanda is led by the Ministry of Finance. That's a, that's that's one example that we have put on the table. In Ethiopia, it's the it's the Ministry of Social Development. In Nigeria, which is the third example, it's a plethora, and um, there, there is engage, increasing engagement of of Parliament. We are working to strengthen that engagement with Parliament and also make sure that Parliament is able to use the data from health as part of his budgeting and accountability processes. So there are many models here, but it's a contribution. The review cannot be done by one partner alone, and it's a contribution by everybody. But the last bit of act is where that's the political side. Um, there are many options for looking at that, but we focused here on what civil society can contribute to act. Um, action for civil society may be outside this politically nuanced relationship because it needs to understand um, remedials, it needs to understand reward, and it needs to really reflect whistleblowing. It needs to look at how to incentivize political will towards alignment, contribution, and less and harmonization. It looks at targeted campaigns. It looks at health and accountability dialogues that are led by civil society. It looks at citizens' engagement, which includes um, a bi-directional action that looks at what citizens bring into policy and what policy takes back to citizens. It's looking at partnership behavior, um, which the IHP Plus has capitalized, and also looking at um, peer accountability among the rights bearers. Finally, it really, really thinks that accountability without teeth is monitoring and evaluation. For accountability to have teeth, it needs to have the whistleblowing remedial and incentivizing functions of civil society. Um, these two, the, the last two slides have been well received by the collaborative and we expect that the follow-on iteration of this would reflect these considerations. The, the, the resourcing of civil society to do this at global and country level has also been discussed with the collaborative and we're waiting to see how the next um, the next, the budgeting process for the collaborative also takes it on, but this also has been accepted as a disconsideration by the collaborative. Um, thank you very much, and I'm sorry if some of you have seen this again, and I'm repeating what you've already heard me say just a month ago. Thank you. Thank you enormously, Laura, for, for that presentation and for sharing your 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 thoughts on it. And um, clearly. And this came uh, many times on, on, on was mentioned many times in the past um, couple of days here as well when we were talking about harmonization. Um, you need qualitative data, otherwise your evidence uh, based advocacy that which um, Susanna was was referring to and, and the potential of meaningfully engaging um, civil society to build on the evidence is is um, it's been flawed because of the quality of the data, but at the same time, you also made it clear um, that is not enough. There is a need for a harmonization uh, rather than the current pro proliferation of mechanisms that we have. Um, and um, I also retain from your presentation the clear invitation to strengthen the civil society voice, and that needs to be supported. And although it seems as a very technical discussion when we talk about data, it is not just technical but very political. And we just have to think about the reluctance from some governments to to track whether there's um, any um, what we so-called key populations, whether they have access to health, and and the point is made. Before um, you might have seen the info uh, to send your questions through which our colleague uh, Liz will read out to the panelists. Um, if you have questions, please do, to give some time to reflect on, on, on what if you haven't seen the message. And I'm to take advantage of the presence of Christine So of Global Health Council next to me to come back on that point about harmonization, uh, reflect on the meeting that we had uh, versus the current proliferation. Um, could you share some thoughts, Christine, on that in particular? Hi, thanks, Tim, um, and thank you to Susanna and Lola and Laura um, for their presentations. And yeah, I'm happy to um, be able to 
add some thoughts um, to what we've heard today around how this all um, comes together. I think that we are faced with the challenge, um, as has been pointed out um, through these different presentations, that there is a need for um, meaningful civil society engagement um, and accountability in all of these various processes. Um, we know that donors frequently are um, driven by their particular mandates and their particular priorities and um, want to set up engagement and accountability mechanisms that really reflect and feed into those priorities. Um, at the same time, we know very well that at the global level and certainly at the national level, the people who are participating from the side of civil society are frequently the same people or the same organizations. Um, we know that we need to build civil society capacity, actually we need to strengthen it, there's quite a lot of capacity already there, but we need to strengthen and reinforce civil society capacity to participate in these various fora. And we also need to look at how to streamline the work so that in fact, we can have singular mechanisms or combined mechanisms that actually can serve multiple purposes rather than having separate mechanisms for each particular um, vertical issue or priority. Um, right now, there are a number of these of different conversations going on um, along these lines. One is around the global data data collaborative that, that Lola has spoken to. Um, another is around the Every Woman, Every Child um, uh, updated strategy and what their accountability platform will look like. Um, there's ongoing discussion around, as we heard from Laura, accountability and advocacy around um, UHC and we've all just spent a couple of days working on harmonization around that topic. Um, there's also the global financing facility and how um, civil society will be engaged in the GFF both in terms of um, influencing the content and strategy of GFF at country level in terms of implementation and in terms of accountability. Um, what we are really trying to do now and I think that we're starting to get to the point where we have a critical mass of interest and these various, um, the, the, the thoughts framing these various pieces are becoming um, more concrete. Um, we are now starting to think about how we bring these together and how we can make um, a more cohesive approach to civil society engagement um, across the board on these various things. I think there are two points that I really want to underline. One is the idea of um, equal weight within these different kinds of initiatives. So I think that what we are hearing very strongly from civil society is not getting civil society as um, an outside actor who knocks on the door and asks to have attention paid to them, but rather thinking about how civil society society, government, and other partners um, come into a, um, an initiative on equal footing and need to follow the same um, rules of engagement, the same kinds of, and respect the same kinds of behavioral expectations. Um, I think the other point that's very important is when thinking in particular about development partners or donors. Um, those who are behind these initiatives, um, as well as some of the civil society representatives who are working on these things, um, is the idea of having some flexibility and looking at what are what are ways that we can be flexible that will permit us to better work with others, um, even if we do sacrifice perhaps a little bit of the crystal sharp focus on our own particular issue, um, it, with the idea that by working together, and um, streamlining and, and building efficiencies around how we're um, working on accountability and engagement, that that will result in um, a better process for all and actually will, will be um, a stronger, um, account, will lead to stronger engagement and accountability in the end. So um, just those are just some thoughts and reflections. Um, what I can say is I think that there are some things starting to happen that are going to lead to um, coordination along these lines and so we'll certainly be updating 
people um, as these things uh, evolve. Um, also, just to remind everyone that on Tuesday the 15th, um, so next week, there will be a webinar around civil society engagement in the global financing facility, and specifically we'll be hearing from the World Bank around the learning event that took place in Kenya with the um, GFF countries, as well as the civil society pre-meeting that took place in Nairobi just before the learning event. Um, so please uh, join us there, and there will be information on the G GHC website posted about that meeting. So thank you, and thank you, Tim, for the opportunity to speak. I think Laura Brearley is going to follow me with a comment um, following, building on what I've just said. Certainly. Thanks so much. Just one quick comment to say that uh, the, the thinking on accountability for UHC is very closely linked to the global health data collaborative work. So the data collaborative did have a title that was very much on monitoring accountability for health, which seems to have transitioned a bit more to monitoring for accountability in health. And in partnership with T. Sperma, who's driving that agenda with USAID and others, we are working to ensure that whatever is proposed for accountability is complementary to the work of the data collaborative and work building on that mandate. It's not duplicative or or in silos. So, so I just wanted to add that in as a reflection on these multiple initiatives that are somewhat joined up, hopefully, and can can strengthen each other rather than confuse the landscape. Thank you, Lara. I am um, going back to you as as participants. So you've seen the invite to send questions through questions for clarifications or comments. Um, so I will now turn over to Liz to list some of the questions to go through some of the questions. Then I'll allow the panelists to reply to those. Sure. So you should see some of the questions on your screen, and I'll just go ahead and read the first one to panelists. So having scorecards certainly allows for insights into delivery of care. When decisions are made based on a scorecard to achieve accountability, we still have to connect the decision to the data that drove that decision. Uh, this link likely also has to be public. Have you seen good examples of publicizing both da the data and that a decision was made largely on the basis of that data? Susanna, can I invite you to try to answer that question? Yes, I was just uh, thinking on a, on a good specific example. Um, I, I think that's, that certainly is happening, and I think the, one of the keys there is that, um, like, you, like the question sort of implies, that there is a, a linkage between the scorecard and some follow-up action. I think that some of the multi-stakeholder accountability uh, mechanisms and partnerships that we've profiled in our report um, do show examples of where they're using scorecards that are built um, by those uh, multi-stakeholder groups um, and shared publicly. So, uh, for example, the, the, the slide that I showed on the Jigawa State Accountability Forum, um, Mama Ye Evidence for Action has done quite a few of exactly what you're describing here, which is to develop scorecards um, with those state accountability forums with a variety of stakeholders who feed into those scorecards um, and then are shared with other stakeholders. Um, and I believe, and I can look um, on their, their website, but I believe they have, they have a number of sort of case studies and e even more in-depth specifics of, um, of how that has led to specific decisions, which I'm happy to, to follow up on and, and share with the group. But yes, I do think that that's happening, but that the key kind of piece is that there needs to be um, a, a process built in for reviewing the scorecard data um, and making sure that there's a discussion not just of, of what the data shows, but then what does that indicate in terms of where the gaps and bottlenecks are and how can various stakeholders be involved in addressing those gaps. And there's roles there really for, for government, for health professionals, for facilities, for um, for civil society, and I think bringing those partners together to identify who can fill the gaps, what various stakeholders' roles are in doing that um, really makes those types of scorecards actionable. 
Um, this is Lola. I also have um, a, a evidence from much of the work in Nigeria of government parliament responding to accountability. Um, on account of the uh, publication of the IHP Plus report, a parliamentary dialogue was held in Nigeria to consider the report of the IHP Plus amongst others. As a result of that, the parliament included, instituted included national budgeting and also resolved to establish a civil society um, development effectiveness fund, which um, we are working on and is included in the cocktail of um, opportunities for expanding domestic financing, which will be launched in Nigeria on the 17th of December by the Honorable Minister of Health. And Liz, uh, there's one more input coming from Lara before turning over back to you. Thanks. Just to add to that list of great examples is the ALMA Africa Leaders Malaria Alliance scorecards, which are an interesting model. They work on public scorecards that are available on their website, but they also work with heads of state to politicize these agendas and have really Ministry of Health and government owned scorecards. Now there are some questions there I think about how accessible they are to other stakeholders, but certainly as an integrated performance management mechanism, it's an interesting model whereby the political will is very explicit there. And, and I think at the end, as, as Susanna referred to, the remedial action loop is really cool, and then those models, that is certainly part of the process. So I think we have some great practices to learn from. Uh, and you, if I can just add to that, I, I, I think also without any prejudice to, to the fact that Action for Global Health is holding this, I think this, the, the, the tracking of European commitment to, to, the, to Gini has also been very useful for us at the country level. The scoring of um, of countries along lines, how well they are they, the partners, how well they are they are reaching their commitment, is also meant that Parliament is able to use that that data at the country level, and the Nigerian Parliament has used it and is resolved to use it as a part of this 2016 budgeting process. That has been very very useful. Um, it, it's it's still poorly disseminated at the country level. Um, and, I, and I think that that that, um, that 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 is good. I, I would like to also flip that question around. The scorecards are very top heavy. Um, they help global civil society and technical agencies do it and score content. I, 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 the scorecards themselves need to be more robust in helping countries to evaluate their development partner of the country offices of the development partner and the impact of Global, global, global health, global action on country, country, country priorities. This is a demand from our parliament. We've just had that discussion with them, and it's a, it, it's a gap that they've noticed. And it would be great if the scorecards and could could take we could take from the Action for Global Health report, which is a good place to start, and begin to look at how we as civil society at the global level can work, global local can work to ensure that we can do that as well with scorecards or can use the action for global health scorecard as a starting point. Thank you, Lola, for that. Um, I don't know what, um, if I saw well, you've sent out through uh, the chat the invitation for colleagues um, who want to join the Global Data Collaborative society group, so that responds to the, the second question. Um, yes, I thought I would save time by doing that. Oh, please, go ahead. No, she said she, she saved time by doing that. Excellent, thank you. Um, Liz, back over to you. Great, um, so then our third question is about propelling governance, uh, citizen participation, transparency, and accountability um, is a core function of people-centered health systems. How do you advocate on the issue that government should allocate resources to create policy dialogue spaces and independent accountability mechanisms? Uh, and this is Lola. I, I think that we can respond, it's not just government, it's also putting pressure on the global community to create AirMAC funding for civil society function global to local. I think that's the pressure we need to put on the collaborative collectively. The collaborative at this moment has agreed in principle to reflect civil society, but its current document inadequately does that. So I think there's first a global, a global reality 
um, I, I, that that needs to occur in terms of allocating resources for independent and policy dialogue spaces. Um, I, I'm going to go back to a bit of history. In 1994, um, the World Bank published Better Health in Africa, Experiences and Lessons Learned, and ex established an expert and independent expert panel for Better Health in Africa. That panel, although located in the World Bank, was able to work independently in 20 countries, and I was fortunate to be a member of that panel. The, the allocation of resources to it, the traction that it had, actually changed a lot at the country level because 20 countries were part of that panel. Um, in Nigeria, it, 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 in Africa, it led to the birth of the African Council for Sustainable Health Development, which the Nigerian government committed $3.2 million to. So th th there is the opportunity, it's not, it's, it's not new to have that independent space protected. The African Council for Sustainable Business Development still exists, although it's not as resourced as it used to be because the capacity of other governments to invest in that was constrained. In Nigeria, Parliament is resolved to set up a civil society fund for aid effectiveness, for development effectiveness, they call it, and accountability. We're working very hard with the Senate Committee and the Senate, Office of the Senate President to also ensure that we as civil society can mobilize domestic resources and allocate a percentage of it to strengthening civil society action for health policy and development. So I, I, I think it's a, it's a beginning and there are many, we need to keep on with the pressure and the ask, but it's beginning to yield shifts first in Nigeria and we can go back and build on the Akoshed model, which 20 countries in Africa contributed. This is Susanna. I'll, I'll add to what Lola is saying. Um, I think that um, it's really important to also be highlighting and documenting examples of, of success where we can show that independent accountability mechanisms, policy dialogue spaces are effective and beneficial for a range of stakeholders so that we can show that Independent, value, independent accountability and civil society involvement in that is not um, uh, going to be sort of this combative, confrontational um, thing with no uh, with no sort of clear next steps and no and no sort of collaborative um, effort to make improvements. And I think the more that we can show examples of how this is working well, um, show that to donors, show that to governments. Um, it will help to um, sort of positively encourage that to happen and um, and to build that trust. And and you know I think that through our research and our report, like I said early on, there there is this understanding of kind of the importance of accountability and generally what it means. But I don't think that particularly global stakeholders really understand how to do it at the country level, how it's actually playing out. Um, and so the more that we can showcase examples of how it's working well, I think that will help. Uh, um, I'm sorry, um, um, it's Lola. I think that's very, very important because when we've, when we've approached a donor, what they've said to us is, what's the value added of that demand by civil society? And I think showing what has worked, country and global, is very important, or what can work and how. Thank you both. I um, there's an eagerness to respond to the question from the side of the table as well. So I'll hand over to uh, Lara firstly. Over to you. Just to share an experience, I mean, uh, building on what's been said as well already, and Susanna, your point about um, the the uh, it not being tokenistic and it being a partnership approach. So some work that we supported in Sierra Leone when I was working with Save the Children and was um, on budget tracking and budget advocacy. And there, I think a few things were crucial to it working well, but one was certainly a partnership approach with the Ministry of Health. This is also the model that has been used in the ALBA, which is accountability loop budget advocacy trainings that WHO and partners have been running regionally to, to bring civil society with parliamentarians, uh, Ministry of Health staff, Ministry of Finance staff, and media together around the table to see the common objectives and opportunities and mutual uh, strengths 
of engaging in this agenda and a strategy moving forwards. The other thing I would add on that is that I think demonstrating the added values that civil society is bringing to the table is critical because this token, I, th I think, unless we can demonstrate why we are adding value to their agenda by in various ways. So for instance, in Sierra Leone, there were no national health accounts that were current. So actually the available ability of data on how much was being allocated to health, how this was changing year on year, just wasn't publicly accessible to Ministry of Health staff as well as others. So we were filling a gap, filling a void by analyzing the data, accessing the data, analyzing it, and presenting it effectively to different stakeholders. So that brought us a seat at the table. The other thing is the political opportunity for people within Ministry of Finance and Health and so on to engage with communities. So there, for instance, with public hearings, that by bringing health program managers to, from, from center to districts and bringing them to a community forum with a community representative who could talk about the real day-to-day -day experience and challenges of, of accessing quality care in their communities and having that face-to-face -face interaction with government policymakers was very valuable and I think it had a political benefit for these individuals too. So, so drawing on that uh, incentive for policymakers to engage with communities is really exciting. Of course, this depends very much on the political culture and the context. So in Sierra Leone, these laws are more, have been more open in the past. Um, I think in other contexts, it would be more challenging to have those types of approaches. Thank you, Lara, for giving another example. Um, it was, so the question about governance is, is much broader than just health, but when it, I would like to take the advantage of the presence of a colleague of WHO, Nick Jante, being present here with us. And we've been uh, meeting for the past two days uh, at Montreux on December 7th and 8th around the effort of harmonizing uh, advocacy efforts and, and, and harmonizing efforts of including meaningfully civil society, assuming that it is a... <laughs> I will stop speaking. So, Coming to this, the, the responsibility of the government, what um, is there that was reflected in the meeting that we could do or should be doing differently? Okay, hi everybody. This is um, I actually I helped to. I mean, I organized the meeting that in Montreux. That was that happened uh, the last two days, and I think you already spoke about that because I wasn't following the full. Uh, webinar uh, at the beginning. So just to add something very, very concrete and very short. I mean, this meeting is, is, is really a first. Uh, it's a first start of something that we want to be bigger in the future. Uh, but it was really interesting to have around the table different stakeholders. I mean, we had agencies, foundations, uh, civil society, but civil society from very broad. I mean, very broad. Uh, uh, constituencies and as well countries and uh, I think it was very interesting to well to see how how both uh, I mean all those sectors were really needed to, uh, to to speak together and to decide and to find out how to speak better uh, at one voice together how to strengthen the message behind the health system and to stop to have those different uh, initiatives going back and forth and if there is a strong uh, movement uh, between an, an alliance between agencies, uh, CSOs, and other stakeholders, and I think what was missing in this meeting it was too early, it's probably the bilaterals. Um, well, then you know we are going to we are going to put uh, in the right and have much better um, governance in a way in the decisions that are taken at country level uh, to improve health system and to improve uh, health outcomes. Uh, which is what we want at the end. So it was just um, just to share that with you and my thought about this meeting and what we should be done, doing in the next phase. Thank you, Annick. I'd like to turn back to Liz um, with the question whether we've received any more questions from the audience. Yes, over to you, Liz. Sure, so we uh, received one more question. 
um, and that is have the diverse accountability mechanisms presented address cases of corruption within health systems. Today is the International Day Against Corruption. However, this is always a non-mentioned neglected uh, issue when talking about the advantages of governance and accountability. Hi, thank you. Really great question. I can only agree that we don't hear enough about corruption. Um, there was a little bit of talk about it at the Financing for Development Conference in um, Addis Ababa in July, and we were able to touch on it during the finance and accountability sessions at the recent Global Health Council Symposium that was held in Washington, D.C. Um, that said, I think that it really remains a topic that is not only under um, investigated and discussed, but also um, has not been this this issue has not been built in in a systematic way to any of the discussions that we're having around financing and accountability. I will say that it is um, definitely a problem when it comes to um, national level accountability. I happened to be working in a country where there was a big corruption scandal um, around Ministry of Health um, finance, financial management and um, there was a breakdown in relationships between government, um, donors, bilateral government representatives and civil society um, and a real lack of any sort of voice that could help um, pave over some of the tensions or, or that's the wrong way to say it, that could help to bring parties together to discuss and work on how to manage the allegations that were being thrown around um, in a constructive way and I think that's one of the big challenges that faces us when we're thinking about corruption is that we don't have um, uh, we don't have mechanisms or operating procedures that have been put together with the thought of how all of the different stakeholders involved have a role or interest in in addressing the question of corruption um, it tends to be handled in a very oppositional manner which actually exacerbates tensions. So I think um, in thinking about some of the stuff that we've been talking about in terms of meaningful accountability mechanisms, I think part of the onus in designing these mechanisms is also to think about how we work through um, allegations of corruption or um, allegations of misuse when they are when they occur. Um, and you know, if a, if a, an accountability platform is really set up to work that way, it should encounter these these situations. But how we end up dealing with them is, I think, still rather a, a, a gray area. Um, so I'll just stop there. And but just to say, I think um, hopefully you'll be hearing more from Global Health Council about this. I think we definitely want to continue um, providing a space for discussion around um, accountability, certainly, and corruption um, in the coming year. Thanks. Thank you, Christine. So, this is Susanna. If I could just add a couple of quick ahead. points as well, yeah. Tim. Uh, I, I think I agree. This is a challenging issue that is not really being thoroughly addressed. I, I do think that transparency is a key first step in getting towards um, exposing and, and um, addressing corruption and um, transparency, particularly around um, budget uh, and disbursement information. Um, so uh, I think that the Open Budget Index is attempting to um, highlight information around transparency of budget information. Um, the African Health Budget Network is also um, has scorecards that show um, uh, how various countries are doing with respect to transparency as well as progress on a number of different indicators um, in terms of allocating uh, percent of their, their, uh, percentage of their budget to health and things like that. So I think the more we can push for transparency as a community um, that will help to start addressing the corruption issue. 
Thank you, Susanna, for, for that input. So, not in an attempt to, to conclude uh, in any way, but clearly it's been a very rich discussion whereby, um, referring to the last point, universal health coverage as assuming a right-based approach to health could build or should build on evidence and, and meaningful um, engagement and accountability. And as such, health as a health sector, we can contribute and be a vehicle for much broader issues about governance and be a vehicle for democratization um, in countries. Universal coverage is uh, very much a political um, issue, a political instrument, because it is about making choices towards a progressive realization of the right to health um, for all. And so <clears throat> what we've heard is a lot, a lot of information. So I hope um, that uh, despite um, the, the quantity of it, that you have uh, a chance to get a sense of the complex landscape. Um, I am positive and I have heard that there is a lot of appetite, uh, perhaps so much appetite that it becomes um, difficult and challenging to keep track of it and, and to, to follow it, so certainly as a civil society, but there's a lot of appetite to, uh, from donors and different agencies to work on civil society engagement, to include accountability within the implementation of the SDGs and within the realization of um, universal health coverage. There were some concrete uh, suggestions moving forward. There's the process uh, that took place around harmonization at Montreux that Annick was referring to. There's the consultation and invitation uh, that Lara referred to the invitation to you all to contribute to the consultation on the accountability around universal health coverage. So um, allow me to close this, this call with some final logistical um, remarks about uh, next steps. So the difference, just to remind you that the uh, different presentations that were made during the call um, will be made available uh, and will be made available to you uh, and being put on the, uh, the various websites. This session, and apologies for not making this clear from the very start, this session is being recorded and we are um, going to attempt to make that recording available as well. We had various uh, colleagues currently traveling but also um, in the so-called Global South who have challenging challenges in, in connecting that were um, asking as well to get a hold of a recorded version. And um, so that will be made available to you. And uh, together with the Global Health Council, we look forward to a number of uh, follow-up uh, webinars on uh, universal health coverage and, and accountability. And I look forward to uh, listen and speak to you in the near future. All the best and thank you once more. Goodbye. Thank you.